Hello. Irvin Welsh's new novel, The Blade Artist, is as dark as anything he's written, and you'll know that that means very bleak indeed. We're once again in the violent world of Francis Begbie, the psychopathic villain we first met in Train Spotting quite a while ago, who's now a successful and apparently respectable artist living in California, but who is easily drawn back by a murder in his family to the unforgiving, cynical underworld in Scotland that his wife hoped he had left behind. I'm talking to Irvin Welsh about the violence and hate he likes to write of, and about whether, for Begbie and his kind, there can ever be redemption. Welcome. Irvin, the point about Begbie, who readers first got to know rather unpleasantly, perhaps in train spotting, is that he can't change, can he? Uh, I think what happens with you know with, with anybody, it's, it becomes like not so much a, a fundamental change in your personality. It's about it's about kind of um, generating new options and new choices. And I think you know we we, we are you know behaviorally we are what we actually do. You know it's what we, you know so. Um, how we kind of think and feel about things doesn't really matter that much. It's how we actually behave. And how we behave is kind of pursuant with the number of choices that we have. And uh, what he's done is he's just opened up a different range of choices. He's not fundamentally changed as a person. He hasn't changed. He is, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, become an artist in California. He's apparently successful. He's married. He's got two new children. But a, a murder in the, in the family, the, the backstory of his own family, takes him back and it appears that his propensity for violence and to slip back into it at the drop of a hat hasn't changed. What does that tell us about him? I think, you know, we, we are kind of environmental and again, it is, you know, it is all about choices. I mean, it's like kind of, uh, he's put back into this environment where he doesn't have the same number of choices. He's not in this place where, you know... That's a very, that's a very... Um, uh, sort of kind way of dealing with him. I mean, come on, he, he, he has a, a, a desire for revenge because of the, uh, the death of someone in his family, don't want to give too much away. And the first thing he does is he stabs somebody with a knitting needle in the back. I mean, yeah, you know. I, I think he kind of, um, he has this, I think, you know, why he stabs it, you know, the, the guy in the back with the knitting needle, I think is like because he resents this lack of choice that he has. He resents, he resents being pushed back Very into apologetic. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> He's got a choice he's, not to do it. He's got a choice not to do it, but I think that, um, again, he's a prisoner of his reputation, basically, and he feels that, you know, he's, he's pushed back into this environment that he feels this is the way he survives in this environment. It's not appropriate to the other environment that he's in, but in this environment, it's how he, it's how he manages to survive it and to manipulate it. Well, it's quite um, easy to accept that somebody who's got his violent tendencies, maybe psychopathic tendencies, who then spends time in prison and for one reason or another isn't rehabilitated, is always likely to be drawn back into this maw of violence, even in Edinburgh, um, which he is. But at the same time, it's hard not to stand back and say, wait a minute, one of the choices you've got is to tell these people to politely go away. I'm not going to fight you again. I'm not going to get involved with murders and I might save my own life in the process. Well, yeah, but I think he's a different character to that. I, don't, I think he's kind of, um, I think, you know, his idea of rehabilitation is basically not getting caught. You know, and he's, it's, it's about control of anger management. So he becomes, a, he becomes instead of being a, a hot-blooded psychopath who's flying off the handle at everybody, he becomes much more cold and much more calculating. Becomes even and therefore worse. much more dangerous. Well, do you believe that rehabilitation, uh, you know, redemption for an evil person, uh, in whatever way you want to interpret that, is possible. Yeah, I think it, I mean, I, I think it is for, for most people. I don't think it is for him. I remember reading somewhere there was a, there was a survey done, which was a, a scientific kind of test done in America, which was kind of hushed up because it has massive ramifications for the, the, the criminal justice system. It was basically saying that they discovered some kind of chemical in the brain that makes people violent, basically. But by the time people get into their 40s, uh, this chemical is gone, it's dissipated. So therefore, you know, t to blame someone for, for something that they're kind of pre-programmed to do, uh, they're not dangerous anymore after 40, so kind of let them go. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, or what, you know, uh, whatever, but um, 
I think that you know there is an element to it. I mean, people just become less violent as they get older. The book, it, it, in the terms that we're talking um, about at the moment, is very, very bleak. I mean, there's not much hope. I mean, here is this character who is a talented artist. He is, as we've discussed, able to just uh, slip back with apparently no guilt and no second thoughts into this terrible violence that he grew up with. And you don't offer any hope that he could be different. He is going to carry on. It's a parable for the narcissism of our times, though. I mean, I think that, you know, that... Um, I mean, I think that he kind of... Uh, you know, as a character, I think he... he in some ways, he's, he's scarily more like uh, the rest of us and like the, you know, the pe people, in, um, people who exercise power in general. That's to do with the, the extreme individualism of our culture, the way it's become extremely individualized and therefore become very narcissistic. And people have that sense of entitlement, and that sense of will to power. And I think you know, that's, that's how I see it as more, as more dangerous and more scary, the fact that it's very much ubiquitous in the kind of the world that we live in. Everyone knows where you come from, who's read any of your work. Um, and, you know, Trainspotting obviously was a, a, a film that caught the public imagination in quite an extraordinary way. When we last spoke in Edinburgh, you talked about the way that you uh, hung out with an old crowd very easily. You just slipped back into it. You know, famous writer, uh, I won't say rich, but no doubt you are, uh, living in Chicago. You come back to Edinburgh and you go out with the boys again. Now, People find it hard that you can sort of slip into that. I mean, you go and watch Hibs playing football and all the rest of it. Can you be the same man you were? Yeah, I don't think anybody's the same person that they are. I mean, I think all the people that I hang out with, they've all changed and moved on to an extent as well. Have they well. got better? Um, I think people just get different. I don't think you get kind of better or worse, really. I think you just kind of get different. I mean, I think that... Uh, I just think that as people get older, in a lot of ways, they get worse. They just get more kind of conservative. Anybody who picks up this book will be in for a, a very uh, fast ride in the sense that, you know, they should know that it's very violent and the world that they enter is one that's uh, pretty dark. What do you say to readers who say, yeah, but it's just a scream of rage? Fair enough, you make yeah, your point, but it's just a scream I of rage. I don't think it is a scream of rage at all. I don't think he's, he's screaming or raging very much. I mean, I think he's like... Um, He's ve he's ve if anything, he's very chillingly cold. What does he teach us? Well, hopefully what people get out of it is that the, the way that we live and, and the way that we've kind of... Um, the, way that this, the world that we've set up, the society that we've set up, and uh, it's closing down our options. And it's making us more narcissistic. It's making us more kind of... Um, more entitled. And we have less resources now to, to, to exercise that kind of thing. And you're arguing that that brings us closer to the darkness that is there waiting for us. I think us. so. I think, you know, I think it is bringing us closer to the darkness. But I think we, you know, but we still do have choices. You know, I mean, he doesn't make, necessarily make the, the right choices. He certainly he's doesn't. Not, he's not got the kind of, maybe he just doesn't have the, the goods to make the right choices. Most of us do. And... Uh, but I think we have to, not just as an individual, I mean, I think we have to make choices as a, you know, as a, as a society in general because that's so conditioned in how we actually behave. Irvin Welsh, thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Jim. Cheers.